Chapter 55. I hated Las Vegas. I suppose I should have known better. How could I have expected but to hate a town that so proudly glorifies bad taste at its most excruciatingly blatant? A town that boasts more powder blue leisure suits per capita than any other spot on the map. A town whose chief attractions continue to be gambling dens in Wayne Newton. A town where a performer of the caliber of Lavinia White could get two weeks worth as a nightclub singer. Yes, ladies and germs, I hated Las Vegas. From the word, go. In fact, by the time Snooky and I entered Circus Circus' immense automatic plate glass front doors, I had already hated Las Vegas for several long, grueling hours. The drive from L.A. was an ordeal comparable to the plague levied upon Egypt by the God of Israel in his last big fit of peak. Matter of fact, a nice plague of boils might have brightened my day. We left early in the morning while the late August weather was still reasonably cool and pleasant. But by mid-morning, the day had turned oppressively hot and dry, and the drive across mile after endless mile of desert highway was uncomfortable in the extreme. Snooky's pacer being, as I've mentioned, without air conditioning, we drove from the win with the windows down and the hot desert air whipped through the car, the effect of which brought vivid new meaning to the term hell on wheels. Somewhere in the vast wasteland, roughly halfway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, the pacer overheated. I should have known better, so much for learning from our mistakes, to the tune of some ominous-looking billows of steam flowing from underneath the hood of the car. With my vast lack of knowledge concerning the internal combustion engine, I assumed it was smoke. I said my prayers, fully expecting to be blown to kingdom come. Forcing, forcing Snooky to pull over to the side of the highway and douse the car's decrepit radiator with water, and we waited in the blistering heat as the engine cooled. I huddled in what little shade the stalled car provided, sucking down one of the diet soft drinks we'd brought along, which was now tepid and syrupy with the heat, and mumbled curses in a voice not unlike Mercedes McCambridge's voiceovers in The Exorcist. Finally, after what had seemed like hours, we climbed back into the car, which seemed even hotter and stuffier than before, and were, like Willie Nelson before us, on the road again. The pacer overheated twice more before finally transporting us safely, if none the better for heat and travel, into Las Vegas. By the time Snooky Pit stopped into a service station just inside the Las Vegas city limits, we were both hot and dirty, and I, for one, was, a, was as mean as a Siamese cat right after you've accidentally sucked its tail into the hoover. I muttered unpleasantries under my breath as Snooky staggered toward the john. When he climbed back into the car, Snooky was chuckling softly to himself. God, I love this place. What's up, I asked. There's a slot machine in the men's room, he reported, and there's a rather rotund middle-aged gentleman in a Hawaiian print shirt who told me he'd been there for over an hour and he wasn't leaving until he hit a jackpot. I love this place. I smiled what must have appeared a wan excuse for a smile, thinking I had obviously entered a highly unhealthy venue, and I wondered if it might not be too late to turn back. Welcome to Las Vegas, Snooky said. As we approached the immense imitation wood-paneled front desk, our faces were damp with sweat and smudged with dirt, the overall effect being sort of a mud pie with eyes. My clothes were sticking uncomfortable, uncomfortably to several key portions of my anatomy and were rapidly grow growing colder and colder in the sudden near-arctic coolness of the grossly over-air-conditioned hotel lobby. I felt like a bag lady. The Pacers' catastrophic performance on the highway had landed us well behind schedule, and we were due at a rehearsal and sound check in the lounge within a few minutes. May I help you? A tall, thin, praying mantis of a young man appeared behind the desk. His dark hair was brilliant. Br brilliant -ed? His dark hair was brilliant. 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 Is that a word? Brilliant time back in the style of a 1920s lounge lizard. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and his upper lip was decorated with a mustache that looked as if he had drawn it out with an eyebrow pencil. From the look of utter distaste on the man's face, I felt assured that Snooks and I looked as scruffy as we felt. He looked as if we were... He looked at us as if we were the Rotorooter man's boot prints. I somehow fought the urge to slap the smug, superior expression off the clerk's face as we signed into our room. 
Oh, the clerk announced. You have several messages here from a Miss Goldberg. Um, whereupon my ears were assaulted by the familiarly unpleasant voice calling from across the lobby. Johnny, Sydney. I turned to see Marsha Goldman making her trademark double time, baby stepping way across the lobby towards us, waving wildly and smiling like a jack-o'-lantern. She wore a bright canary yellow sundress in which her voluminous gazongas seemed to take on lives of their own, with high-heeled sandals on her tiny feet. A huge straw purse hung in the crook of her elbow. Where in the world have you been, Marcia demanded, a miniature mama. Well, Snook started to explain, but Marcia interrupted. So hurry up already, she said, gesticulating with her cigarette-wielding hand. You'll be late for the rehearsal. She tapped her foot impatiently on the durable indoor-outdoor carpeting on the lobby floor. I was sure I could see the desk clerk wince as Marcia flicked her cigarette ash onto the floor next to her red lacquered toenails. We're going to be late as it is, and we certainly don't want to look unprofessional now, do we? Make a bad first impression here and it'll be over the strip by morning and you'll never work this town again. I can promise you that. Now, come on, already. She ordered with a gesture of her small childlike hands that suggested shooing baby chicks into the chicken house. Have someone take their bags up, will you? Marcia tossed over her shoulder to the desk clerk, confident that it was no sooner said than done and skittered off toward the lounge. What tornado hit you two anyways? Marcia asked, just a bit too loud. You look like Drek. She rummaged through her purse and extracted two tiny foil packets containing wash-and-dry pre-moistened towelettes. Here, use these, she said, handing one packet to each of us. You look awful, but there's nothing we can do about it now. There's just no time. And she skittered on ahead through, dramatic pause, the casino. I had never seen anything like it before. The immense room was blindingly bright with fluorescent lights that flashed and sparkled like a Christmas tree gone berserk. Although Marcia was talking non-stop over her shoulder as she led us through the casino, she was completely inaudible over the deafening din of clanging bells, buzzing buzzers, the mechanical whirr of the one-armed bandits, and the steady jingle-jangle-jingle of coins. Everywhere I turned, as far as the eye could see, there were people, easily two whole generations of America's Caucasian middle class, the only dark-skinned people I could spot were sweeping up, dressed in blinding synthetic fabrics, intensely engaged in various games involving ca cash and chance. Men in baggy flower print shirts with white shoes and matching belts gleefully gathered their money, hard-earned over a quarter century working the graveyard shift at Lockheed or pushing Kenmore side-by-sides at Sears Roebuck, and stacked it onto roulette tables, never to see it again. Ladies with hair of unnatural hues piled high upon their heads yanked at slot machine handles with surprising vigor. I tapped Snooks on the shoulder. I'll never in all my life see... I've never in all my life seen so many... Slot machines? Snooky essayed over the noise. Wiglets, I replied. We followed Marcia through the casino and toward a curtained-off area beyond. Tossing the curtain aside with a flip of her hand, Marcia admitted us to the lounge. The room was only dimly lit, unlike the casino, and I was momentarily blinded by the abrupt change in light. When we finally, ab when finally able to distinguish large shapes... I could see chairs stacked upside down on the tiny cocktail table tables blah, 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 blah. behind the bar <clears throat> at the rear of the room. Stood a good. Wait, I'm gonna have to redo that. I'm a cold. Um, behind the bar at the rear of the room stood a good-looking, dark-haired animal with a mustache, wiping glasses. Ahead of us, on a small but workable stage, a rather short, dark man, what I could scarcely allow myself to believe was a canary yellow polyester jogging suit, seven or eight outsized gaudy rings, several gold neck chains, and a monstrous pompadour welded together with enough petroleum to lube a 65 Buick, was singing Quando, Quando, Quando. If this rendition was any indication of the man's talent, Frank Sinatra could continue to sleep peacefully at night. The singer, and I'm using the term quite loosely here, was accompanied by what was obviously the house combo, three less interested-looking individuals one could scarcely hope to find. I had hoped to encounter a higher grade of talent in Las Vegas, even in a lounge. I'm going to be violently ill, I whispered to Snooks. Now quit. Oh, good, Marcia said in what she probably considered a whisper. Johnny's still rehearsing, so we're not late. Is Johnny What's-His-Name torn to a swing version of Lover, with an energy and fervor quite unmatched by vocal tone quality, I spotted Lavinia White, seated at one of the half-dollar-sized tables in the very center of the room. <coughs> a vision in a snow-white sweatsuit, 
matching jogging shoes and those funky little short, short, short socks with the pom-pom at the heel. Her hair was wrapped under a white scarf and a heady, heady Lamarish turban effect. Her face was nearly obscured by the oversized foster grants she wore, despite the darkness of the room. She was stirring absently a styrofoam cup from which dangled the tag end of a Lipton flow-through tea bag with one hand and tapping a testy little drum roll on the tabletop with the other. She was every inch a star. Among the people seated at, perched upon and leaning against three or four tables surrounding Lavinia's, I spotted half a dozen or so young men whose long, uncupped hair, spandex tank tops, and unhealthy postures made them immediately recognizable as musicians. I remembered a couple of them from Lavinia's Blue Dahlia show. The others were obviously late recruits. There were also three good-looking young black women in pastel sweatsuits who I later learned were Lavinia's makeup girls, Lavinia's wardrobe mistress, and Lavinia's hairstylist. <coughs> as I recall... One, two, or perhaps all three of these ladies were named Lawanda. Sitting alone, an overflowing ashtray, her only company, sucking a cigarette like tomorrow had just been canceled, wearing a t-shirt with the Equal Rights Amendment printed across the bosom, and the look of a woman who has just heard on the six o'clock news that her brand of feminine hygiene spray has been found to cause cancer in laboratory animals, was Randy. I stopped to say hello, as Snooky went to check on the stage setup and Marsha to confer with Lavinia. What's up, lady? I pulled the second chair off the tabletop and seated myself as Stradlet. Shit. Randy, Randy managed to squeeze three or four syllables out of the word. Shit. I'm going to kill that little bitch. Am I safe in assuming we're referred to um, our star? Randy turned up her nose as if she had just dropped her peanut butter sandwich into a cow cookie and nodded. Might I venture to ask why? At this point, I had yet to actually meet Lavinia White. Randy and I had rehearsed together with Lavinia's musical director and, I assumed, boyfriend, Tyrone, a tall, handsome, copper-colored gentleman with chemically straightened hair and a penchant for pimpish attire and too much cologne. This rehearsal would be the first time we actually sang with the diva herself. She sends Marsha over here to tell me to make sure I don't sing too loud or move too much or upstage her in any way. Randy stabbed her cigarette into the mound of butts in the ashtray. Fuck, I could upstage this little bitch if I was dead and buried. Plus, she lit up another camel filter. Plus, she says I gotta wear a dress. A dress! You'd think she'd been ordered to have her entire body tattooed. <coughs> You'd think she'd, be or she'd been ordered to have her entire body tattooed. Shit, I don't even own a dress. They're gonna make me wear one of hers. I swear, I don't know how I let Marsha talk me into this shit. I need this like hemorrhoids. Now, Randy, I decided to play Mr. Blessed Are the Peacemakers. Maybe running into someone even more seriously pissed off than I, I was took the wind out of my sails. Maybe we could cut Miss Lavinia some slack here. I'd like to cut her throat. Man. <coughs> I'd like to cut her some throat. No, really. I laid my hand somewhat tentatively on Randy's. Lest we forget, this is Lavinia's Vegas debut, almost undoubtedly the apex of her career thus far. She really needs for this gig to be a success, and she's a little nervous. And you are, heaven knows, one very strong performer. She's probably just a little bit afraid of you. Who wouldn't be? <coughs> God. Yeah, her expression softened a bit. Yeah, let's give the diva a chance. She's probably not such a bad egg. At which point Marsha approached our table. Okay, kids, let's get started, shall we? She leaned in close behind between Randy and me. By the way, you two, Vinny was giving some thought to having the backup sing from the wings. I saw Randy's eyes and lips fly open in tandem. I can only imagine mine did the same. From the wings? Randy tried to whisper but did not quite succeed. Off stage? I attempted an air of cool attachment and fa failed miserably. Uh-huh. Marsha pretended everything was just hunky-dory. She wasn't fooling anybody. Just a thought. Marsha called over her shoulder as she rushed toward the stage. Just something to think about. Randy shot me a see-what-I-mean look. Forget what I said, I whispered. This is war. <coughs> as it turned out, Randy and I were not relegated to the wings. We were, however, placed as far upstage of the diva herself as was humanly possible while still remaining on stage. One would have thought we were carrying at least one highly contagious disease apiece. Randy and I decided during the rehearsal to do everything in our combined power to blow Miss Vinny right off the stage. 
Hell hath no fury like a pissed off performer. We sang at the very top of our capacity, which for both of us was considerable. When the sound man all but turned off our mics, we improvised some rather distracting choreography during the ballads. Neither of us was overly surprised when, immediately following the show, Marcia cornered us and let us know in no uncertain terms that if either of us even considered pulling a stunt like that again, not only would we both be out of a job, not only would we never work in this town again, but Marcia promised to personally execute the manual removal of our spleens if we attempted to undermine Lavinia's act. Not that we would have. It wouldn't have been any fun anyways. Because, our admittedly childish prank string notwithstanding, Randy and I did fancy ourselves professionals. And because, much to our chagrin, Las Vegas seemed to love Lavinia nearly as much as Lavinia claimed to love Las Vegas, it was SRO in the little lounge for Vinny's every performer. But her third night, Marsh, by her third night, <coughs> God, Marcia was negotiating with the hotel management to have Lavinia held over for two additional weeks. We were a success. Whether or not I found Lavinia White personally sick-making, and her act the very epitome of everything I was, a, I find abhorrent in show business. Oh, I've never been so stupid as to sabotage any success in which I play a part, regardless of how small that part. That was my, that my part in Lavinia's show consisted almost entirely of standing far upstage in almost complete darkness, wearing a pair of peg tuxedo pants and a powder blue ruffled shirt, singing Taking It to the Streets over and over for what seemed like hours, made clear to me something I should have known all along. I like being center stage, and I really hate being in the background. Listening to roomful after roomful of people enthusiastically applauding Lavinia White's anemic renditions of Diana Ross hits, and much of what truly sucked in the 70s, musically speaking, made me miserable. By the third night, I was perfectly morose. So, I might add, was Randy. We required no words to express our shared misery. The utterly defeated look in our eyes was sufficient. Snooky, by contrast, seemed to be having the time of his very life. Since he'd done very little other than my shows for nearly two years, I'm sure the change of scenery was good for him. Besides, within the first week of our arrival in Las Vegas, Snooky had won over $200 at the roulette tables, developed an unrequited but obviously enjoyable crush on Lavinia's drummer, just the sort of shaggy, stringy musician type Snooky fell for every time. Had what he termed a truly transcendent one-night stand with the handsome lounge bartender, and discovered the hotel's subterranean spa, where a well-muscled well, well masseur pummeled away at Snooky's shoulders <coughs> for a mere $5 tip, treated him to what was later described as a better-than-average handjob. Snooky suggested I loosen up and have some fun, as I was in Las fucking Vegas for crying out loud. And although I really wanted to loosen up and have some fun, the facts of the matter were that I truly hated singing for Lavinia White, and as I'm sure I've mentioned, I hated Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, I found time has no meaning. As anyone who's ever been there will tell you, the strip is designed so that all of one's waking hours are spent indoors, away from windows, watches, sundials, ancient Aztec stone calendars, or any other reminder that time waits for no one. It passes you by. Reminders that somewhere the sun was rising or setting, that somewhere somebody was sleeping, the obvious rationale being that nobody gambles while he sleeps. I found Las Vegas' perpetual artificial high noon utterly disconcerting. I quickly came to resent the fact that I could look at my watch, read 3 o'clock, and have no immediate environmental clue as to whether it was 3 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon. All the lights were blindingly ablaze. The casino was a manic hornet's nest of activity, and the games went on day and night, a.m. or p.m., I found this state of affairs plastic and unhealthy, like cheese whiz. It scarcely took me the time required to lose seven dollars worth of nickels to the one-armed bandits to figure out that I was definitely not the gambling kind. With, the, with very little else available in the way of daytime entertainment on the Las, Vag Las, Vegas, Las Vegas Strip, I spent my days in the hotel room I shared with Snooky, watching old movies and used car salesmen on TV, reading magazine after magazine, cursing my fate and missing Keith. A week into our engagement, right after the show, I called Keith at home. Mm -hmm. He answered, being wide awake and somewhat wired after the performance, I hadn't considered that for some, it was nearly 3 a.m. Keith? KT? Did I wake you? Duh. 
Nah, he lied. How are you? I'm all right, I lied. God, I miss you. I miss you too, babe. I wish I could hold you, kiss you. Jeez. <coughs> what? I'm getting hard. Me too. We better talk about something else before this conversation enters the realm of the obscene. Okay, I said, I miss you. I miss you too, babe. We laughed. I sat for a long, expensive moment, smiling foolishly to myself and caressing the telephone receiver. Babe, Keith finally broke the silence. Huh. Was there something you wanted to say? Oh no, I just wanted to hear your voice. Then we better hang up. This is undoubtedly costing somebody some money. Oh yeah. You go back to sleep, okay? I love you, babe. Chunk. A chunk chunk. A chunk chunk. I love you too. <laughs>